Think React Lead Show. My name is Dom Fawcett, your executive coach and leadership speaker. And today we've got a guest, not to make it all weird, but I know this guy, this is Grant Kazada. He told me not to church it up, which I'm not, but it's Grant Kazada. Kazada. Yeah, that's Kizada. like a church way to say it. I got I, you. I think it's pronounced Smith, though. No, okay. <laughs> Spanish. Got it. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So I had Grant on my radio show about a year ago. And what Grant doesn't know is that footage I lost. I didn't lose. I lost the drive that it went on. That's why yeah. it just got posted to YouTube. I don't know, about a, three weeks ago. Yeah, he sent me the link. Thanks. So I sent him the link and I and I said, you know what? Since I'm talking to him, let me invite him to the show. So what you don't know about Grant um, is, correct me if I'm wrong, 14 years military, army to be specific, yep. ranger sniper to be even more specific, yep. eight years active duty. Mm -hmm. And then the latter part you spent in Prescott? Correct. Yeah. So I got out of active duty 2014 and then uh, my wife and I moved back to Prescott. Okay. And been there uh, ever since. Stayed in the Arizona National Guard. Still do that. Um, so I'm at 15 or 15 years now. So, okay. And yeah. you doing the whole, I'm just going to assume you're going to do the whole thing. Yeah, we'll see. No I mean, it's a lot of, I think the businesses have just got okay. real busy. And so now it's like, I don't even care about Right. The, the you don't need that yeah, the band retirement the right for, exactly for military so so we're just going to jump right into this an army ranger sniper invites me out to go shooting and actually hunting is what it is and i'm not gonna lie grant i'm thinking to myself what well do i need to go practice a lot more do i and i i know the answer is no no but it's a little intimidating because everything's a competition with me and yeah. sure you're dialed in the same way yeah, I have, I have guys trying to beat my record of like 56 birds in, in three days. <laughs> it's not going to we'll happen. What happens. We'll see. We'll see. Well, last year was a good year because there was about 57 of us that went. Okay. And uh, like 25 of us got COVID. And so we're all out there still shooting in South Dakota snow. Of course. Killing birds. Right. Coughing up a lung and like <laughs> getting back drinking and then just going to sleep for hours, shivering. So. You know, and so Grant invited me last year. I'm glad I didn't go. Right. <laughs> you left that Everybody part lived. out. <laughs> Everybody lived. Yeah. But what? So I, I haven't gone. Only thing I've known is, OK, pheasants, which I've seen a couple of those. Yeah. And I Googled average temperature that time of year. Twenty nine degrees. OK, well, I'll suck it up. Now, you've been doing this for how long? This will be our fifth year. And okay. uh, I would say there's only like one year where it was extremely cold the last couple of years. Probably two or three out of the days you could be wearing a short sleeve shirt. Oh so wow! It really okay. wasn't too bad. It okay, was, it was it was doable, very comfortable. You know, like and you're only out there for three hours a day, so it's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad at all. So let's talk business. Yeah, the whole show is not going to be about business, but you you have a handful of businesses. So what are the business that businesses that you have? Yeah, so we're we're located up in Prescott. Yep, and uh, we have Founding Fathers Collective. Okay, uh, which is about a fourteen thousand square foot warehouse we purchased back in two thousand eighteen. Uh, and then that is kind of the conglomerate company that owns Founding Fathers Properties, which we have a couple different pieces of property up there. Um, we have City Tavern, which is a 65 wall self-serve tap wall. So it's the largest in the state. And I think we're the fifth or sixth largest in the country. Is that the, is, is that the tavern that's connected to the warehouse that I was at? Um, that has the coffee bar. Yeah. yeah. That has the jet. Yep. So it's okay. inside. It's like a speakeasy, right? Uh -huh. Okay. So 65 wall self-serve tap wall. So beer, wine, kombucha mm -hmm. teas. Alcoholics or alcoholics, everybody's <laughs> alcoholic. Um, Non-alcoholic drinks and then right. even have cocktails and okay, straight Jameson for all the military guys. Out Got there. it. Uh, and then a specialty coffee shop. Uh, we have a barber shop, which just won. Uh, still gives me hope that that men can compete against women at any level because they just are smashing us. But we just won <laughs> top top ten salons in the country. In okay, the salon today, which very is very nice. Great. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So. Um, that and then we have Liberty Mercantile, which is a retail side of it. Uh, and then we're getting ready to launch that online. And then we have Founders Gym, which is like a functional fitness CrossFit uh, gym, which we have um, just a lot more class basis based. Okay. Uh, and then we have a members only speakeasy, so like a, a hidden bar. And the last thing that we have there is our buddy Rob Johnson owns GD Jiu Jitsu, or it used to be GD Jiu Jitsu, and now it's. Uh, Mountain Tribe Jiu Jitsu. Mountain Tribe Jiu Jitsu. Yep. And all of this is in the same yeah. location. So, folks, I've been to this warehouse. He calls it a warehouse once. And, like, looking at Grant and then you thinking warehouse, it is very dialed in. Like, the, yeah. the, the, the coffee bar itself is 
you walk in it's like oh shoot i have to really think like yeah there's a lot of options so i'm sitting there and then you got obviously i don't really need haircuts but the barbershop is a it's a man's barbershop not a men's barbershop it's a man's barbershop yeah and it actually looks like one but my and i don't drink but my favorite was the speakeasy like the speakeasy is very classy yeah it's it's smaller. It's about 40 seats. Okay. And, uh, everything in there is membership based. And so the whole idea with that was, um, or the intentionality behind it was like, Hey, we don't want to compete with another other bars in the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you, how do you really bring people together and, right. and provide an outlet for individuals within the community and, and kind of our region to, um, really kind of let their hair down and, and relax mm -hmm. in, in an environment that's comfortable for them. And so we turn it into an annual membership okay. uh, from the beginning. And that's kind of the driving force between uh, the speakeasy part of it. And then it, a fun way to like have alcohol on the premise, like mm -hmm. hard alcohol, but without degrading it to a, into the context of your, your typical bar where everybody's in the trash and you're dealing with the 21 year old kid, right. like the college like, kids, making a mess and, and bikers, and so, damn bikers. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you, it, it really collects a lot of people right. and then it really turns into, um, I don't want to say a think tank, but you have a lot of fun, productive conversations, a lot of good business conversations and just relationship building of course. in the community. So that's kind of the, that was the focus of it. So. Well, and it, it takes a certain type of person that wants to uh, put some coin down towards an annual membership yeah. for a very um, m minute group of people mm -hmm. um it's, there's just a certain mindset that comes with that yeah and they're also spending the money on some right. what do they call it top shelf is that is that yeah we some, have some, some top shelf stuff some top shelf uh you know whiskeys and okay and, uh, so it's it's a it was a very fun way to have an alcohol content mm -hmm. same with this the uh tap wall you know we, you have beer you have all the wines and everything else that's on the wall but it turned it more into an experience-based concept right because now you're no longer walking in as a patron or a customer and you just kind of sit reserved in your corner mm -hmm. with your, your buddies and you don't really care what's going on. And now you're you're forced to get up to go to the wall to serve yourself. And then you're able to sit there next to some lady or gentleman that might be 20 years older or younger than right. you. Right. And then it turns, it really turns into more of a community feel and you, mm -hmm. it's not just about the alcohol, you know, like that makes sense. Hey, I can have a beer, I can taste it, you know, one or two ounces and go try something else. And Correct. And then I'm sitting next to a guy like you, and it's like, maybe our paths never cross, but we're on the tap wall, and it's like, we're just having hey, a conversation. Your story, you know, I tried that yesterday. So it, it, we've done a good job at collecting a lot of different people and demographics mm -hmm. in the community, and really providing something for everybody. So now, how does and this is probably going to lead us into the next segment of the show, but how does an an, an army ranger sniper mm -hmm. go from that, yeah, to wanting to bring people together? Uh, and create an experience for people to, I don't know, have long, like lifelong friendships, long lasting conversations. Yeah. How do those two mm -hmm. merge? Yeah. So, um, so I kind of got to start before I went to the army mm -hmm. uh, when I at 23, but I started as a <clears throat> funny, I was Zohan before there was Zohan. So, um, moved out to Missouri from, from Arizona. Okay. I got into cutting hair as a joke. So I was a hairdresser for about three years. You said hair. You were a hairdresser, hairdresser like a straight up how? women's hair, cut hair, and uh, killer. So can we on. let's how? You, so yeah. you, you strike me as a dude in yeah. high school. There's like mm -hmm. high school sports yeah, athlete, sports. Mm -hmm. right? And then you get out your dude's dude, maybe a jock. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, you're doing yeah. hair. Yeah. So my wife and I were dating at the time. Okay. It, up in Prescott for about two and a half years, we broke up. I moved to Missouri. She came down to ASU, um, and then the very first day I moved out to Missouri. I was staying with a buddy and his parents for a couple of weeks before I got on my own. And uh, he just opens up this, it was his birthday. So right. he, I pulled in right when he's getting the mail and he opens up a letter and there's like 500 bucks cash in there. And this is like 2000, 2001 or something. It's like, that's a lot of cash. You know, like where'd you get You're that? 27 years old. Yeah, you're 500 bucks is a long way. You, just got 500 <laughs> exactly. bucks. you know, it's like, who gave you that cash? And he's like, oh, just one of my parents' friends. He gives me and my brothers 500 bucks every year since we were kids. And I was like, well, what does that guy do? And he's like, he's a hairdresser, in Baltimore. He owns a salon. It's like, <laughs> what? Okay, well, that's cool. You <laughs> right. <feel the> cash. <laughs> right. So um, so I, I started looking into it and I realized like, okay, well, I can kind of, you know, you set your own schedule, you talk to people all day, you're mm -hmm. inside. Um, and as a young single guy, it's like, well, I can be around. With <laughs> so that's cool. Exactly. And I was in a college town in Missouri, so okay. Springfield. 
And uh, so I went to hair school and then um, ended up working for a really good buddy of mine. And him and his wife own a, they were actually just, they just left today from Springfield. So they came out with their kids, but they own the largest uh, salon in Springfield. So 8,500 square feet, studio four and seven. And then they have uh, a string of barber shops at like 12 of them. And so they're just killing it. Um, and anyways, I was working for him in the salon and did that for about three years, but I always wanted to do the military and I got in trouble when I was 16, so I couldn't go, go in at 18. Okay. Um, and so I ended up joining the, the army and, uh, went in with a two year contract cause I couldn't get into special operations with a contract. So it was like, Hey, I'm either going to bust my ass and right and get in or I'm getting out. So, uh, ended up getting a contract for Ranger regiment. Let's let's here, here, let's just, let's pause there. Yeah. That's a whole there. There's some backstory there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm just going to share this with anybody watching. You have heard the last part of what Grant said and anybody with kids, your kids, maybe knuckleheads, preteens, teens. Trust me, like you're looking at two guys and I'm sure there's a story behind that 16 year old incident. But your kids will become somebody one day. You just. You instill maybe the fear of God in them. Maybe you instill some things. Maybe you give up on them and they join the military like we did. But know that there's hope for who they are to become in the future. Again, I'm Dom Fawcett. This is the Think React Lead Show. My guest here today is Grant Quesada, and we will see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Think React Lead Show. I'm your host, Dom Fawcett, executive coach and leadership speaker with Think React Lead in studio still with Grant Casada. And right before break, um, we started talking about or Grant was talking about uh, kind of what led him to where he's at now. And he kind of tried to slide in there that he was a hairstylist. Is that the, yeah. uh, the correct uh, title? Yeah, hairdresser. Hair, hair, hairdresser. And uh, and I think when we left off, you, you joined the Army at 23. Uh-huh. And did you go in with the mindset of I'm, I'm going to be a ranger? Yeah, that was the, um, so 23, this was 2006. And, uh, I wanted to go into special operations. The biggest concern was the war was going to be over. Okay. And so I, I was very familiar with how special operations worked. And of course the SEAL teams and SF and PJs and, you know, I'd read books, I had family that was in some of those units. Um, and so the, the army was where I got in and, going to range regiment was like the fastest way to get into the war. And so, um, that was the direction I went. So it's been eight years in, in ranger regiment up at second ranger battalion in Fort Lewis. Um, was up there for six deployments. So I went, was up there for nine, went on six to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, my last four deployments, I was a sniper. So I spent about five years, um, as a sniper and went to several, you know, military shooting schools right. and then civilian schools, uh, and then got out in 2014. So were, were you able to implement any of the skill set that you had in real world? Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say a lot of it was just patience and, and drive, of course, and determination. Okay. And I think one of the biggest reasons why I gravitated towards uh, like business mm -hmm. was a lot more the, the pursuit of like autonomy on the battlefield. So right. a sniper or that job, um, what drew me to that job was a lot more of the, um, the autonomy on the battle space, the okay. ability to succeed or fail kind of right. on my own right. The ability to, um, you have kind of that level of responsibility that was put on you to, to be put into certain situations that are kind of hairy and it's just you and a buddy and you just really have to think on your feet and problem solve and, and have that kind of, um, mental aptitude and, and flexibility with so. with you being a people person prior to going in mm -hmm. right um was there ever time that you were looking through your scope and you just saw like you viewed people differently not when i say different i mean and i've never done what you do but you look through a scope and you're able to see a person's life doing whatever they're doing without you, them even knowing you're there <clears throat> yeah it's it was um it's very interesting you know because i it started off like everybody does pretty much in uh in regiment or a lot of these other units and I was an assaulter and then a master breacher. And so you're kicking in doors and doing all that stuff. And so you're acting, but you're reacting, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you come around a corner and there's maybe somebody there. And so you're, you're talking microseconds of, right. of reactionary uh, involvement in those scenarios. But 
when you get behind a long gun, a lot more of that um, reaction, you have, you have time to process and think what you're doing before you maybe have to act. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there's a lot more, um, you actually afforded the time, you know, before you just uh, choose to do something. Of course. And so it wasn't, it, 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 you know, I, there was nothing I ever did like overseas where it kind of bothered me on a moral or, or ethical level. No, um, but how, how about when you like, when you look through your lens watching. and you just see people living. Yeah, it's very, like you see people living their yeah. day to day because you're not there for five minutes. You're there for a long time. Well, a lot of our, the majority of all our missions are at nighttime. And okay. so it was, uh, a, a lot of stuff was just happening like at nighttime. It's very okay. dynamic. Um, you, you know, we're, we're watching people and the, the reality was, I'm watching them understand that they have no idea right. that I'm, you know, a hundred, 200 yards away and they're just, they're out doing their thing and, and it's nighttime on okay. top of that. So one, they won't even, wouldn't even know I was there Right. and it's at nighttime. And so if they happen to be up, you know, they don't, they have no idea okay. where I'm at. So it was just, that, that's very, it's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then for, for, for somebody, you know, you, there's always these kids that aspire to be somebody yeah. like yourself, mm -hmm. right? What are some things that, or what's one thing you would advise a, a young man or woman that wants to do what you do, do what you did? What's, what should they be doing now to prep themselves? Um, I think the biggest, especially in hindsight now, mm -hmm. work on having a solid moral framework. Okay. Uh, a moral base, ethically, uh, morally, like understand what your principles are mm -hmm. as an individual. Because at some point, you know, if you if you're going into the military, that type of line of work, uh, law enforcement, firefighter, you're going to be faced with circumstances that the general population, you know, very well might not ever experience themselves in their life, in their lives, right? And so then you're you're dealing with the the psychology of um, how your brain processes mm -hmm. a moral and ethical issue. Okay. Uh, which I think is it a lot, leads a lot to that schism of of kind of hey I think I'm this type of person and then you actually have to do something <laughs> in real life right. know, that might break your moral ethical code mm -hmm. uh, and then you're trying to put back together what that looks like when you get out of the military and so I think that that that's probably one of the um, you know it's a it's a big part of PTSD right oh yeah to understand like hey this is who I thought I was and when I experienced something or I, maybe I did something. And now I'm trying to figure out how does that fit into my moral framework, you know? Right. You're trying to force it. Uh, yeah. And so I, I would say that is probably the biggest thing outside of the physically training and all that stuff. Right. Like, the normal stuff. Yeah. And having like a mental acuity or aptitude or the strength, the strength mentally to, to make yourself um, go through those rigors. Right. But really to be very assured of who you are mm -hmm. on, a, on a moral ethical framework and then um, don't don't divert from that. That makes you, sense. You find yourself in those circumstances. And so. and not to digress, but knowing that people hold themselves, they're they're always their toughest critic, right? Mm -hmm. Did you ever have did you ever feel less than whatever you did at 16 mm -hmm. limited your ability to go in at 18? Did that ever play on you? Like, dang, I messed up, or it's Yeah, um, I don't think so, man. I okay. Got, so I got in trouble when I was 16, robbed a store, you know, went to jail. Right. Uh, it, it was literally the first day I'd ever did school in my life, and I just swung for the fences. You know, yeah, go, you went go you bigger, go, go bigger. <laughs> it's like my life model. So I was like, I'm gonna go ditch school. Like I'm going big. Like, oh, <laughs> Most I'm guys hang out behind the big. bleachers. You're okay. Yeah, and so um, my stepdad, you know, he retired in the army. He was a special forces or green beret, uh, and then my mom's a psychologist. And you know, I grew up in very a very solid um, household. Right. And obviously, I had everything I. You know they could invest it to me as a kid, of course. Good decisions. And that was an example of just making a, a, dumb <laughs> a horrible decision. Horrible. Okay. I, you know, I grew up playing sports, I right? Playing sports at the time in, in high school, and just for whatever reason, when you're 16, you just you do know, a lot of stupid stuff. So, parents, I'm gonna stupid. go back to talking to you guys and gals. <laughs> your 16 year olds, they may be, I can't use the R word, they may not be wrapped that tight. But you know, one day those screws will get tightened. You're looking yeah. at two individuals. I mean, I graduated with a 2.7, uh, 2.1. Yeah. And then, you know, you got a GED, man. <laughs> exactly. But, but, yeah, city but, council and a bunch of business. Whatever, you know, so. But we're doing all right. So when we come back from break, we're going to talk more about 
um, the sniper, not the sniper, but yourself, but how that kind of quantifies what you're doing today. Again, I'm Dom Falsett in studio with my guest. Uh, can we just call you Grant yeah, for now? Absolutely. Grant, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Think React Lead Show. I'm Dom Falsett, your executive coach and leadership speaker. And we are going to continue our conversation with Army Ranger Sniper, Grant Quesada. You know what? I don't, you're more than an Army Ranger Sniper, so I'm not going to use that title for you anymore. <laughs> it is a cool title. I'm not going to lie. But uh, you've got a lot of businesses and yeah. there's a lot of, there's a lot of veterans that I know have reached out to you, but I know personally have reached out to me. How do you do it? How do you, you just freaking do it. Yeah. Do you have a lot of veterans reach out to you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I mean, where I live, it's the most uh, densely populated area for okay. veterans in the country. So like 20% of our population is vets. You're like the go-to guy, I could imagine. Yeah, and then we employ, we have a team of about 52 right now. And I would say, I think nine or 10 of them are, are veterans. Okay. And so um, it, it's been really cool and fortunate to kind of work with them bring in their skill set and mindset, you know, because it's it's a different mindset. Uh, it is. At any level in the military, like bringing them into a civilian type of work environment and then um, not holding, like holding them to a higher standard. Right. But uh, putting that expectation that like, hey, you guys, you know, you're coming out of the military, you're a leader there. We want that in the civilian sector. Um, you don't want to run it like a, a military type of ship, you know, right. type thing for business, but, um, it's, it's a good synergy between men and women that have never been around the military. Mm -hmm. And then you have military individuals that are working with us and they work together. And so there's, there's good community camaraderie type of, um, overflow. So it's healthy. What do you think is speaking of healthy, what do you think is the most unhealthy aspect to some of the, of the veterans that you've seen that have come into the business sector and kind of failed? What, 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 What's one thing you would attribute to that? Um, I think probably the the most unhealthy mindset I continue to see in veterans when they they assimilate back into society. One, it's either they feel like something's owed to them, okay. or they uh, their whole identity as an individual becomes who they were in the mm -hmm. military, and so they're they're never able to quite get back into uh, kind of a, a normal civilian mindset again uh and, and so therefore it kind of they default whether they know it or not it's it's kind of like a chip on their shoulder like hey right. the country owes me or the state owes me or my my common man or woman owes me something for my service and it's like dude you're the one that raised your hand right you, you said yes. you all raise the right. hand at whatever state you get out now you're back in normal life it's like it's on you to take the the skill set and the tools you've learned and implement that in some capacity into your normal everyday life you know? that makes sense and so um but a lot of that comes down to like having the maturity um and intestinal fortitude to like re really desire that for yourself mm -hmm. you know and not use it as a crutch and, and expect some type of handout as a veteran right. you know like i don't i don't play the veteran card too often and and at this point too it's like it i'm sure just like you or anybody else it's like i can't believe i actually did some of the stuff i did you know i'm so far removed now as a civilian mm -hmm. uh, just a normal guy that it's like I and I used to fly around in helicopters and do all sorts of cool right. stuff and jump out of planes and er everything else that you dream is like a little guy and you go and do it. <laughs> Not as a forty year old, you know, right? <laughs> exactly. And now you, I'm in civilian world and I'm running a business with a, a great buddy of mine and who's an Air Force veteran. Okay. And so uh, it's a totally different. You just can't thrive on the past, you know. And I think I too it. many yeah. people they peak, they allow that to define who they are, mm -hmm. and then moving forward, it's always like. Hey, that's who I am, and so they just want to they want to go back to the, right. the best part of who they think they were, mm -hmm. but they don't allow themselves to actually use it as a launching point to to go right. forward and do something better. Because that's exactly what it is. It's yeah. a launching pad. And I remember when I, I I got out, I joined, I became a cop. I got out of law enforcement. I walked into a Walmart and I saw a greeter, older huh. gentleman with a um, a Vietnam hat on, and he had some pins on his shirt. And as I walked past him, because I, I was holding on to that for our military, I'm an ex-cop. Yeah. And I saw that and I was like, if I don't change today, I'm going to be that guy. Yep. And I see so many veterans, um, as, as, especially to operate it at the level that you're at, struggle with trying to get into business because they yeah. 
there's just this uh, attachment, but you've obviously have done it very well. Just as I hear you talking, what I'm attributing that you were some, I went in, I'm going to use the word nobody. I went in as a nobody. I didn't have an identity. That was it. I knew by the time I was 11, I was going to join the military. You went in, you were somebody like you had a, a good job or career, what it yeah. sounded like. And then you did this stint and then you still do the business aspect of it. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I think going in at 23, I had a five years uh, difference between some of my peers mm-hmm. that were 18. Right. That I, that I was going through training with. Um, but two, I think a huge part of that is when I went in, I just knew from the very beginning, um, one, a lot of the men I served with were friends of circumstance. Like not, oh, right. not that we weren't buddies, but the reality was like, we're all finding ourselves in a situation that we normally wouldn't find ourselves in for one. So true. And you're around a lot of driven, motivated individuals that are working and operating at a level that it's very rare to see. And mm-hmm. most people will never experience that. And then two, um, at some point the game's going to end, whether you do your two years, or you do your 30 years, in the military, mm-hmm. you're going to have to get out. And at the end of the day, you do come to the realization that I'm a cog in the wheel. It doesn't matter Correct. how good I was at my job or how efficient I was. As soon as you step out of that role, there's somebody behind you that's going to take it, take it over. Right. And then you just move about your day <laughs> to the next thing. capacity. And so I never allow that to define who I was as an individual. That makes and, sense. And I was very, um, I think a huge part of that was I attribute that to my wife and us and our relationship was mm-hmm. was very healthy throughout the whole time I was in. Can, can we talk about that a yeah. little bit when we come back from break? Totally. All right, folks, so. we are, you. a lot of conversation here, a lot of takeaways for you that want to go somewhere in life, you parents that aren't really sure what's going on with your kids. But again, I'm Dom Fawcett, your executive coach and leadership speaker here on the Think React Lead Show, and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome back to the Think React Lead Radio Show. I'm your host, Dom Fawcett, and let's just continue our conversation. You mentioned your wife, and I'm glad you did. Um, were you married prior to going in? Um, so the same lady we were talking about like a couple minutes ago. Yeah. So we dated for about two years. We broke up. She moved down here. I moved to Missouri. Uh, and then when I joined the military, we started dating again. It pretty much just went right into marriage. So Okay. No military no way. Yeah, no time to waste. Um, we'd already dated. We've known each other since second grade, so there's no oh, reason wow. to, no reason to like try to open that bag up again and do the dating thing. It was like, hey, we're either getting married or not. So <clears throat> as soon as I graduated basic training, uh, we got married that Christmas time, and then okay. we, we were married. Well, we still are, but we're uh, we're coming up to 16 years. This Congratulations! Yeah, thanks. That's man. huge. So we have three kids, two boys and a girl. Okay. Um, I beat the Ranger curse, meaning. I actually had boys when I was in active duty. Right. All my buddies. It was hilarious because the running joke, of course, was like, you know, you're going to have girls. So many of my buddies always had girls. But however, that being said, is all my sniper buddies, we all had boys. Oh, wow. And so all our buddies on the line are like having girls and we're the ones having boys. Like, what is up with you guys? It's like, hey, we're just Dang. out of stress. Apparently. Right. <laughs> we're built to a sniper, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, two boys and a girl. And so... Uh, and my wife now, she's a social worker and she works at the VA. So she okay. deals with a lot of veterans. Right. Um, so it's it's healthy in that capacity to right. to have her, uh, you know, to where we can converse. And, and I'm able to dialogue and give her feedback as a veteran of what it's like to maybe as she's dealing with some of the Vietnam mm-hmm. vets and other veterans. And then she's able to obviously come in and clinically, I don't want to say diagnose me, but you right. know, she, she has the training and the education to... Um, this thinking process with me on, you know, whatever I experienced. So do, do you think that her training and, and this might sound like a does obvious answer? Yes. But do you think that her training has attributed to one better understanding you and making your marriage a little stronger? Um, yeah, I'm sure it's, it's gotta be, but okay. she, you know, she, she, her undergrad was in criminal justice and she went back to school just graduated maybe two or three years ago. Okay. Social work degree. Okay. So we were married for a solid, at least a solid 10 years. Before okay. She even started her master's. She goes already said there was no, yeah. the cement was dry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've just had a healthy marriage the whole time and, and, um, and we're, we're both really strong individuals. Like, okay. Personality wise. So in that capacity, every time I would deploy, uh, or go on any type of training events, mm-hmm. you know, I think at the, 
at the very tail end of my eight years on active duty, we were doing the math, and I think we only saw each other on average about two and a half, three months a year. Absence so makes the hardcore fonder, yeah, huh? Yeah, so it's like deployed <laughs> once or twice every year. I'm on, you know, ed- schools and training exercises right. and all the other crap. And so, um, and so she's just a very strong, capable, confident woman. And, okay. And so it, it helped our marriage immensely because it's not imagine. like she was, she didn't need me, you know, right. which is, which is, there's a healthy level and very you, healthy. you need that, I, you know, in, in a spouse um, to some capacity. Some, I would say guys mm-hmm. like yourself, I know guys like me, like I'm, I'm pretty bullheaded yeah. and I need somebody to not allow me to. Oh yeah. Yeah. She, <clears throat> a perfect example, like iron sharpens iron. She's right. very strong willed. And so, you know, we butt heads often, but it's, it's in a healthy. It's with, with respect. Yeah. 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 And, and I know I wouldn't be the man I, I am today without her. So yeah, that's, that's, I would say that's most men in, in yeah. our shoes. So, um, and I don't know if it was during break or during one of the episodes, but you mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, something about politics. Yeah. You're running yeah. for, look, yeah, so I just ran that. for city council. Okay. In Prescott. Um, How'd that go? It, it was very great experience. You okay. meet a lot of people. Um, yeah. I love politics, love philosophy, okay. uh, love our country. Mm-hmm. And so I was running for city council and did not go the way that I, I thought it was going to go. And uh, I'm friends with our, our mayor and, and a couple of the city council members. So right. it turned out two mayoral, mayoral races and there was six of us running for three council seats or five. And so I, I was in a runoff after the primaries. Okay. And, uh, and when I had the ability to slow down, like kind of reassess after we kind of lost in the primaries because the generals, I think were today. So Got it. I could have gone till today um, and either one I lost again, but um, after kind of reassessing and reevaluating, I just, I, I stepped aside, pitched the ball to uh, a friend of mine. She was running as well. And she okay. was at that point, I felt like she was more the competent person, you know, she, her education and what she brought to the table. And so, right. Her and I were running, and if it would have gone the way we anticipated, I think there was a lot of momentum that I could have helped out with within the community, right? Um, especially as a small business owner, and, and um, you know, my strengths are very much like collaborating, bringing people together, mm-hmm. uh, providing vision and, and direction, and clarity, um, and then just allowing and empowering others to to kind of pick up the ball, you know, because I know my weaknesses, and and so it's it's just never been an ego thing, for of course, capacity, but. Once we kind of lost and it went the direction that we didn't, didn't foresee, it was like, well, I'm okay with that. You know, like she's the better candidate. She's she brings a lot more strength to the table in that capacity. And so I stepped aside and was able to uh, kind of focus on what will two years and four years look like. Right. And that's kind of the direction I'm going with with that level in politics. Okay, that makes sense. Level. Um, <laughs> but I'm not not quitting. Ain't no quitter, right? No, just <laughs> so. So strategic, you teach strategic, right? And it was strategic <laughs> <laughs> for those of you watching that we, we both know that's not a real word, but go with me on this one. Yeah. You, you, you've got a very large footprint in Prescott mm-hmm. yeah. um, and not just in the veteran community, just in the community as a whole. Um, what I'm going to ask two questions, one specific to the business. And then, but the first one is how do you show a veteran that there's so much more on the other side of this life. Let's call it life. Yeah. And, and like you tackled it head on. You've done very, very well. Folks, he's very modest. He was modest on the radio show. He's modest here. Um, his footprint's a lot larger than he's giving himself credit for. And I, I can't really talk to it, but it's a very large footprint. Um, and he's very, very well respected in a very large, I'm going to call it a large city. There's a lot of people in Prescott right now. Yeah, yeah, our region now is like a hundred, hundred eighty thousand or something. Right, there, so. there's not a place you can go where, where people don't know you. Yeah, right. Say that. And you're back to being respected, and you don't you don't have an ego. You don't wear your past on your chest or your head, and and you treat people with respect, right? Um, but what do you? How do you tell somebody who has your heightened skill set to like, bro? You there's so much more you could do mm-hmm. with what you've learned. Yeah, I um, I would attribute it to kind of like what what do you want to do when you get out of the military, mm-hmm. and what type of pursuits are you are you looking for? Got and it. For me, uh, 
I was going to do it through business. Okay. So I started a one share barber shop and I knew that was going to be the catalyst to grow everything else. But my intention was like, how do I impact the community um, from a leadership standpoint? So you started right. Right. With the- my, my intentions from the very beginning were like, okay. how do I help lead this community? How do really through service, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're leading like le- servant leadership. Correct. You know? And so how do I, how do I do that from a, what I perceive is a healthy, um, you know, moralistic ethical framework that really uh, invites people into the okay. narrative of, of ownership and citizenship. That makes sense. As, as people that live in the community. Okay. And then, um, and then do a good job of bringing people together and really highlighting the best parts uh, for me, you know, living up in, in Prescott, the best parts of what Prescott is by by really um, allowing Prescott to shine and bringing people together and like conducting uh, everything we do in a business capacity um, above board and hiring well, paying people well. Mm-hmm. And our retention rate is for our team. We've been open for a year. Uh, we're at 92%, you know, for a team of 50 something and everybody else went through COVID and you know, there's a, there's a line of people trying to, to work with us. And, uh, and really that it comes down to Jesse and I, my, my business partner, Jesse, okay. but, um, <clears throat> we're all about empowering our team, giving them the ability, the latitude to, uh, and the flexibility to make their own decisions to fail or succeed. We don't need to hold their feet to the fire. Mm-hmm. We, we really do believe in like work with adults. They should want to do the right thing. Um, and if, if you give them the ability and the autonomy to take ownership of what Correct. they're doing, then, then they start taking ownership of the brand and that the business sense. and then they, they want to succeed. And so it's, and, and then it's not us micromanaging, it's us just empowering. And so really that's your job as a leader, right? Like it is, you, you define the vision and the mission mm-hmm. and the direction you're going. And then you empower other people to do that with you. And then when they leave, which is going to happen because that's life. It's okay. You know, like not our vision of what we're trying to do and impa- and how we're going to impact right. our community is not everybody's vision that works with us. And if they're there for six months or a year or five years, at some point they're going to leave and want to go do their own thing. And so how do I come alongside and actually help them accomplish that? Um, because I, I see them more as like they're on loan. Correct. Believing in my vision. And I that's the right to, way to leave. Yeah. And, and whenever they, whenever they're leaving, they better leave better than when they got there. Of right? course. Um, and so I, I, that's the way we approach business. That's the way we approach everything in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesse and I sit on a bunch of com- different charities and, and uh, boards with okay. the community over the last several years. Imagine. So back to your point of like, I guess if you're a veteran getting out, um, you have, there's a lot of skill sets that the military gives you a whole bunch a lot yeah and you just have to you have to take a proactive approach okay and um and believe one in who you are and what you're trying to accomplish but uh and have the humility to understand you don't know it all there's a (laughs) lot of people out there that know a lot more than you and if you just ask you know a lot of people are willing to help you out so and i and i also think it it starts i i tell people that you know it leadership starts at home oh yeah like it's it's very you 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 have a good relationship with your wife. I have a great relationship with mine. You can tell when somebody yeah. doesn't, right? When they come no matter how no matter what facade they try to put on, you can tell, but I just from experience can can know that when I go to work, when I go do whatever it is that I'm doing business related, that comfortability and the the non-angst of I get to go home and have fun with my wife. I get to go home and relax. I get to go home and I don't have to worry about a text message coming through like, oh, it's going to be one of those. I, I don't get that. And you don't get that either. You're very relaxed. Yeah. And you made a statement earlier that you wouldn't be the man that you are today had not been for your wife. So kudos to her on that. And one, I did not know you were open only a year because I was just there a year ago. Yeah. And I remember, folks, when I walked in, I met this young lady who was the server, the greeter, maybe the greeter. And she was and it was er, one. It was early to it was cold, cold for me. <laughs> and she was very like warm. She was very welcoming. And I walked in. She's like, oh, let me, you can sit here. You can try the coffee. And she, she educated. She did all this stuff in like 30 seconds. I'm like and I'm thinking because I'm a trainer. Yeah. I'm thinking whoever did your leadership, tra- whoever did your customer service training. Kudos to them because you've taken it and you're doing well. And that was my initial interaction with your your businesses. So 
whatever you're doing, outstanding job there. That was yeah, that Thanks was a, a win. Man. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, our goal, you know, when we have our team and everybody's coming on board, which really we don't we don't hire too often because we, our retention rate's so high. But it was really um, a focus of we need to take care of our team and we mm-hmm. need to empower them and, and really give them the ability and understanding to to know what's expected of them. Um, but we want them to have a fun place to work. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the younger generation, and I think a lot in our culture nowadays, we value our time. And yes. so to give them the ability to, you know, like once again, our vision is not there. So if Correct. one of our young girls, 17 or whatever, 20 that's working in the coffee shop or one of our older guys or older, or older ladies that work there, if they're like, Hey, I, I want to take a day off or two days off to go do something. It's like, okay, cool. Right. How can we help you out? Cause at the end of the day, it's like, dude, if they want to go do something for themselves, they should have the freedom and, and bandwidth to go do that. And we'll figure it out. It's not a big deal. And not feel the angst of, Oh, I got to ask for time off. Yeah. Yeah. And, but what it's done is like, it allows our whole team to just know outside of doing something really stupid. There, right. There really is nothing they're going to get yelled at or okay. they're not snapping at them. You know, it's like, they know if they need a day off or if they want to go do something with, um, you know, a spouse or with a family, whether it's a day or a week or two weeks, it's mm-hmm. like, good, man, go, go have a fun time. You should go enjoy yourself. You know, like what, what advice would you give leaders? Cause I've never worked for somebody mm-hmm. like you. I came from the corporate space for 14 yeah. years. So what advice would you give leaders? Um, obviously you're a leader and you're doing it well. Your retention is high. Yeah. What advice would you give to an owner, owner of a company who struggles with retention? Yeah, I would say it is so important to understand what your mission is as a, as a business owner or a leader. Clarify that mission or vision with your team mm. and then give them or empower them to carry that out and get out of the way. That's the last part of that. <laughs> get out, get of, out of the way. Yeah. Have, have the humility to understand just because you built something doesn't mean... Uh, you're going to know better than 50 people that you employ or two people you employ, you know, like everybody has different ways of problem solving. That makes sense. And and so, and a lot of times you just by stepping back and giving them the expectation or the, Mm -hmm. or the, um, the ability or the privilege to, to do something on their own. Right. That accomplishes a mission. They might solve it in three steps and you're, you're in your head, solve it in five, you know, Mm -hmm. so you can't know everything. It's exhausting to think you, you, you will, um, I don't have the time and the patience to, to do that. I'd much rather just <laughs> you hire right. humility. Right. Like, yeah, I'm going to hire somebody that knows right. more than me and give them the ability to do that. And of course, go do something else like play in a sandbox or something. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Go hunt pheasants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think that's a huge part of it. It's just empowering your team and then trusting, trusting them and what they're capable of doing. Okay. And, and I, I always joke about it, but it's like, I'm not getting shot at. So, there's no way some person on the team is going to implode the business within one choice. It's funny. If it's going to happen, it's going to be from Jesse and I. Yeah, right. We're going to blow up our own business. It's not going to be one person. Exactly. You can fix that. You know, so <laughs> it's funny. I've never heard anybody say it. So people will ask me, Dom, how do you do all the, all the stuff you do? I'm like, bro, a beast getting shot at. Yeah. And I've never heard, even though there's a lot of guys who have been, but I've never heard anybody use it. No. And it, like, I use it all the time. Like, that, isn't that hard? No, it's like I'm gonna live no matter what I try to do. I mean, I've tried a TV show three times. This is the, yeah. the fourth time. I'll, I'll keep trying until it sticks. Yeah, and I think as a nation, as a country, we've become so um, man. We 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 live at a time in a in a country right now of just opulence and wealth, and everything is given to us on a silver platter, really at whatever level you are, right? We all just went through COVID. Mm -hmm. And even if you got wrecked through COVID, whether you worked for somebody or it's on your own, everybody still has their iPhone. Everybody still has their fucking TV. Life really wasn't that disrupted. Um, And we just don't have an understanding of what it's like to actually struggle in life these days. And I, I think it does a huge disservice to us as a nation, not understanding what it's like to fail and try to succeed again and fail and succeed that's the best learning lessons you're going to have. Yes, it like is actually understanding what it's like to actually fail at something and appreciation for what yeah. you don't, when you yeah. do succeed and have that honest, 
you know, conversation with yourself of like, man, I really mess it up. I blew that one. <laughs> yeah, I need to try, but I'm going to try it again. Right. You know? And too many people are too timid to really try something. You know, I was re- I was listening to a podcast the other day, but they said 86% of America, um, they're not they're not happy in what they're doing with their life, or they're just not happy in, in, in their general. Life in general. Yeah. It's like, man, that is a so that's horrible. I, exactly. I love my life. Right. I love what I do. You know, I know I work a lot. I know I can stop when I, you know, when I need mm-hmm. to focus on my family, go do what I want to do. But it's like, I can't imagine not being appreciative of what I have or being happy in what I'm doing and find the joy in that. And it's, um, it's disheartening because it's, you, you see people are getting robbed from, mm-hmm. from life, um, from living, yeah, from life, from living, yeah, yeah. finding that happiness and joy. So, well, man, Hey Grant, thank you very much for coming in on the show. Yeah. Appreciate absolutely. that. Thanks for coming down folks. Grant Casada. If you're ever in, is it Prescott Valley? Prescott, Arizona. Prescott, Arizona. Founding Fathers Collective. Uh, you can find us at foundingfatherscollective.com. Uh, we're right downtown, a block and a half northwest of the square. So you have to go. It's a it's a great experience. So yeah. thanks again for watching. I'm Dom Falset, your host of the Think React Lead Show, and we'll see you on the other side. Yeah.